Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship at St. Child's. We are so glad you're joining us. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us virtually, we are glad you're with us today. If you're here in the sanctuary, we would ask that you take the black register at the end of the pew to sign it and pass it down so that you can see who's sitting next to you and everybody next to you can see who you are. If you're joining us online, we'd love for you to leave a note in the chat or send a message to the office so we can say hello. A few announcements to share before worship begins today. Um, this morning, we are glad to have some new liturgical art hanging before you, these banners, which were created by our creative worship team. That's a sub committee of the worship committee, and um, we're going to focus all of worship next week on the banners, the work that they've done, and the God's good creation all around us. So if you want to hear more of the story, come next week and bring friends. We also want to say thank you for those who worked together yesterday moving furniture. If you came in the back door of the church, you saw a dumpster filled with furniture. All of that furniture is old, it's stained, some of it's ripped, some of it was stinky, and it was deemed unrepairable. So um, we are glad to have some new neighbors using our Taylor Education Building. In order for them to have room to be there during the week, we need to take out some of our old stuff. So that's out in the dumpster. We're really glad for those who shared their um, arms and backs yesterday getting that out. There are still a few things that need to be moved out of the Education Building and into the fellowship hall. So we have some furniture we want to keep, but it can't stay where it is. If you have time today or in the next couple of days to move a few things, let me know. It won't take long. Just a few odds and ends. Next Sunday night, we will have a barbecue and game night that is from 4 to 6 p.m. We want you to bring your best barbecue, or if you're not, uh, you know, a barbecue maker, maybe you're a barbecue picker-upper and you can find your best barbecue place and bring something to share. We will provide the sides, so all you need is, uh, like they say at Arby's, the meats. <laughs> and, um, or like, you could do like that thing with banana peels or whatever vegan or vegetarian option you want, but bring your favorite barbecue to share and then any games that you want to play. It would be a great good time. So hope to see you next Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. for barbecues and games. With that, take a deep breath and notice the presence of God in this room. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in and hold it. Breathe out and pause. Continue to breathe in and out, creating stillness in a world of busyness, finding sacredness among the ordinary, delighting in the world that was created for you to be in in this moment, in this time, with your sisters and brothers and the Spirit of God. Children of God, welcome to worship. Let us praise God together.
Eve, Adam, Tamar, Judah, Rahab, Salmon, Ruth, Boaz, Bathsheba, David, and Mary, our ancestors reflected you, and we share their DNA. Gomer, Isaiah, John, Phoebe, Amos, Martin, Dorothy, Deborah, Paul, Nathan, Shifra, and Pua. Your prophets told your story, and we live to build your world. Elijah, Mary, Stephen, Peter, Esther, Jael, Zerubbabel, the Samaritan, the woman who was hemorrhaging, and the many unnamed bearers of the light. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. As God's called and beloved servants, we bear witness and join our voices in triumphant song. Praise be to God. Please be seated as we continue worship with a time of prayer and confession. As we come to the font, we encounter waters of life. Waters which are poured out, waters which symbolize the cleansing nature and healing balm of God. But waters which also remind of an infinite cycle of life and death and resurrection. For as the waters are poured, they will splash and create water vapor, water vapor which you will breathe, water which you may drink at some point, water which will become part of the clouds of the sky, or the waters that splash down from the mountains and roar like thunder or flow like God's unending justice. So come to the waters in fullness. Come in truth, in hope, in mercy and compassion, but let us always come with honesty. Let us pray. We are all your children. We are all witnesses to your love. What we do is seen and assessed by the world. When our actions are holy, the reflection of your image blazes like sunlight off a well-polished mirror. However, when our actions pursue our selfish desires, cause harm, or increase the suffering in the world, we make it harder for others to live or see your face. Lord of justice and compassion, call me out. Display my sin before me and my community. 
Help me to see the harm I have caused and the pain I have increased. In your mercy, surround me by the great cloud of witnesses and lift me up from my fall so that my walk together and the light may increase. Judge and condemn my sins. Forgive me and reunite me with my sisters and brothers to work for your glory. Listen, for the cycle is unbroken. Child of God, you bear the light of Christ. Nothing, absolutely no thing in this world can separate you from the love of God. So here and believe the truth. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As we turn to God's word, let us turn to God in prayer. Holy One, Holy Three, Mother and Father and Maker of us all, you who have created us and sent us into the world, not on our own, but in community with you and with one another, this day as we Turn to the reading of your word. May we find community with Jesus Christ, your Son, and may the Holy Spirit illumine the path before us, making the way clear and giving us courage. Amen. The first reading today is from the book of Hebrews in the 11th chapter, beginning in the 29th verse. Listen now for the word of God to the people of God. By faith, the people of God crossed the Red Sea as if they were on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried it, they were drowned. By faith, Jericho's walls fell after the people marched around them for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, wasn't killed with a disobedient because she welcomed the spies in peace. What more can I say? I would run out of time if I told you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Through faith, they conquered kingdoms, brought about justice, realized promises, shut the mouths of lions, put out raging fires, escaped from the edge of the sword, found strength in weakness, were mighty in war, and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured and refused to be released so they could gain a better resurrection. But others experienced public shame by being taunted and whipped. They were even put in chains and in prison. They were stoned to death. They were cut in two and they died by being murdered with swords. They went around wearing the skins of sheep and goats, needy, oppressed, and mistreated. The world did not deserve them. 
They wandered around in deserts, mountains, caves, and holes in the ground. All these people did not receive what was promised, though they were given approval for their faith. God provided something better for us, so they wouldn't be made perfect without us. So then, with endurance... Let's also run the race that is laid out in front of us. Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's throw off any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that traps us, and fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame, for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him, and sat down at the right side of God's throne. This ends the first reading. Now, this morning, um, for the time for children, I want to invite children who commonly come um, to venture to the same ordinary spot. But I also want to ask students of any age to come down this morning and teachers, substitute teachers, college professors, classroom aides. If you are a student this year, if you are a teacher this year, come on down. Oh, here. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go, Hannah. Thank you. You guys can just sort of fill in. You can sit on the steps. You can... Oh, thank you. Okay, I'll hold your backpack. Come on down. Do you want to perch over here in this direction? Or you want to scoot in? You guys, can you scooch in? Here. Or, okay. So how many people are... How many people are going back later, like in a week or two? Okay, see, we've got some of everybody, some wishful thinking, too. Uh, how do you guys feel about school this year? Are you exci- Good? Yes! Excitement! Uh-oh. <laughs> and we have some people on the other side. So when you come to church, we, when I'm with the preschoolers, we say, um, whose house is this? God's house. This is God's house. So we all come into God's house, and when we come, we say, thank you, God, just as we do when we visit any friend's house. We say, thank you for inviting us here, and we bring the best of what we have to share. Then when we go out of this place, different from when we go to a friend's house, we leave our friend's house there. Leave God's house. Does God stay here? Mm Mm-mm. God goes with us wherever we go. So when you go to school, God is with you there. And this morning we're talking about this great cloud of witnesses, which sounds like sort of a funny way to describe people. But out in the world, God is there with you. And also out in the world is the church. All the people that you see here this morning and all the people that are worshiping at St. Peter's and all the people that are worshiping at Covenant and Grace and all the churches, they're all out there in the world with you wherever you go, wherever school is for you. And so um, this year, I hope that you see the cloud of witnesses that are around you every day and you feel God within you wherever you go. And I hope that you can be um, part of God's light in the world. So ordinarily, I have you guys um, say a prayer with me, but today I'm going to pray for you and I'm probably going to (laughs) cry. So let's all say our prayer. Put your hands together and close your eyes. Dear God, thank you for this day and this church. Thank you for our community of saints, for the students and teachers that we have here. We pray your blessing of safety on each of them that they would trust in your abiding presence wherever they go, and they would celebrate the gifts that you have given them 
whether that is a gift of wisdom or a gift of playfulness, a gift of curiosity or a gift of patience. We give thanks for who you are in each of these people and the ways that they will care for one another in their schools. We pray that our schools would be communities steeped in your kindness, in your mercy, in your love and joy and generosity, and that each of our students and teachers would bear your good fruit in the world this week. Bless each of these people and the tools they take to school in backpacks and briefcases, and um, may they all feel your presence with them each day. Amen. You guys can go back and sit down in the sanctuary or go off to the nursery for a lesson. (laughs) Almost. Who comes to mind when you think of the great cloud of witnesses? This is that part of the sermon that's interactive. The part where you like say names. Who comes to mind? Mothers, grandparents, Martha, who else? Moses, friends. Oftentimes, I think we think of this great cloud of witnesses as one of those puffy cotton candy clouds, right? The one where you could be like, oh, look, there's a dinosaur. Oh, no, look, that's, there's my grandma up in the clouds. Oh, I just love laying in this meadow, holding hands, surrounded by daisies, while the bees sing a song that's non-threatening, but so sweet, like honey. And we get to look up into this beautiful cloud together. I love that. See, my whole life I have been taught to be nice and polite. Now, if you know me, this doesn't mean that I have excelled or gotten top marks always in that lesson. However, it is quite clear to me that being nice and polite are two of the highest ideals for a person in our world. And this is especially true when you don a robe or wear a collar or carry the title of clergy. You see, people have this idea, and they will say things to me or to Meg or to other clergy that you are held to a higher standard. And usually, when someone says, you, Adam, are held to a higher standard, it usually means I have stepped out of my place. (laughs) It usually means I'm not quite being as nice and polite as one thinks I ought to be. You see, for good clergy, you're supposed to not make waves. You're supposed to go with the flow, uphold the status quo. You're supposed to handle your problems indirectly, not cause conflict, stir trouble, never create division. That's what good clergy do, is often the teaching. Those people did not go to the seminary I went to. (laughs) And that's okay. You see... Usually, we think about people as being nice and polite. And the ideal, as it has been given to me, is that any follower of Christ is to be sweeter than banana pudding, gentler than a feather duster, and more polite than one of those people who just graduated cotillion and is at the debutante ball. There are many times, however, when God grows weary of this strange facade that we have lifted up as the ideal. Listen as Jesus continues to teach and instruct people in Luke's gospel. 
Jesus looked out of the crowd and said, I came to cast fire upon the earth. How I wish that it was already ablaze. I have a baptism I must experience. How distressed until uh, it is completed. (sighs) Do you think that I have come to bring peace to earth? No. 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 I tell you, I have come instead to bring division. From now on, a household of five will be divided. Three against two and two against three. Father will square off against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Now Jesus also said this to the crowds. When you see a cloud forming in the west, you immediately will say, it's going to rain. And indeed, it does rain. And when a south wind blows, you will say a heat wave is coming. And indeed, a heat wave is coming. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the conditions of the earth and the conditions of the sky. How is it then that you don't know how to interpret this present time? That's Jesus' teaching today. And we often will say things like, this is the word of God, thanks be to God. So here's another question. How are we interpreting the present time? What today makes God angry? And before you answer, I want you to pause, think, what makes God angry? Your answer should be grounded in the things in Scripture. Human trafficking. Injustice, human trafficking, great. What else? Intolerance, Intolerance. what else? Destruction. Destruction of the earth. Meanness. Meanness. Hate. All these things make God angry. And they ought to make us angry. And I'm not talking about that kind of anger that you say like, oh, what a shame. What a shame that human trafficking is happening. Oh, there is an island bigger than two Texases in the Pacific Ocean made out of plastic and debris that we've created. Isn't it tragic? No, I'm talking like the kind of anger that makes you want to take the communion table and throw it off of this stage and say, this is not okay. The kind of anger that makes you break the system and say, never again can we do this. We cannot go up to a brother or sister and say, you do not belong in this world. It would be better off if you did not exist. The kind of anger that says, this is where God wants it to stop. So that creation, so that life, so that resurrection can be born again. Let me tell you a little story, if I may, about how I think anger sometimes looks in the world. I uh, went to seminary at Louisville Seminary, and we had this class called Chats. Within that class, there was a student who really thought it was important to do their readings and show up to class well prepared. One day, when we were discussing feminist theology, we were all in our discussion group, right? And um, a student named Calvin started the discussion by saying, well, I don't really like feminist theology, so here's what I think. And this student took their hand, slammed it on the table, and said, let me tell you something. And they hunched up on the table, and then they started saying this. They said, listen, I do not care to hear your opinion about what you think about feminist theology any more than I care to hear anyone else who hasn't done the reading spout out about something else. The reality is, we have all prepped and worked hard to be here. And then you show up day in and day out and act like it's just whatever you want it to be. I need you to come prepared to class. I need you to try. I need you to do the work that we are all trying to do so that we can make the world a better place. And I do not care if you don't want to show up and do that as long as you are silent. 
But if you want to come and give me your opinion, then I need you to do the work and show up because everyone else here is showing up. And I am mad and I'm tired and I'm fed up with the nonsense that is happening. Now, as that student was talking, they started to realize they were screaming at an entire classroom. And this was so wildly inappropriate. But they couldn't stop because there was something in them that said, it is not okay to make other people feel less in this world. And when we're talking about feminist theology, queer theology, about indigenous people's theology, about people from systems and communities that are deeply marginalized, speaking as if they have the voice of God and saying, it's okay for me to have voice and presence at the table, and this is how I see God, and my perspective is valid. For that student, it was not okay to just wipe them out and invalidate other perspectives. And so there was something so critically important to say God's justice has to include so great a cloud of witnesses that all people have voice and space at the table. Now this student was super embarrassed by the end of class because they knew they'd probably crossed a line and that forever, in seminary, their experience would be different because they just yelled at their classmates and not subtly. In no way was it subtly. That story went on to become legend among all students and faculty at that seminary about the one kid who lost it in chats. That student also went to that professor immediately after class and said, I am so embarrassed and sorry. I did not mean to be disruptive. I did not mean to call people out. I'm sure it was inappropriate. I will understand if I need to step out and not come back to class. Like, it was, a, it was well beyond where it should have been. And the professor looked at the student and said, Adam, You are not to apologize for what you did ever again. Sometimes there are moments where we break. And sometimes there are moments when the Spirit will inspire you to speak. Was it a little over the top? Maybe. But did you voice the concerns that your professors have had for your class throughout this whole semester and how there have been a number of people just not showing up prepared or ready to have difficult discussions? Yes. You said things that we could never have said as professors. And while we're not going to encourage you to do that every week, there was truth in the voice. I ended up getting an award for interpreting scripture and for fighting for justice from the seminary. I desperately wanted to win all the awards for like the nice, polite, popular kid. Not what I ever got. It's just not my cup of tea. You see, there are times in the world where God calls us to fight, to be activists, to stand up against injustice. Have you ever had that experience where you have felt called? Called to fight and stand up for something that you knew was right, and you knew that people were going to criticize you for it. Have you ever had to stand up and say, this is not right, in the face of even overwhelming odds, where even if you made a difference, the difference you made probably wouldn't change the world, but you felt you were still being called to do it? We've all had moments in life where we have come up and seen things that simply do not need to be. So please, do not let the world tell you when it is appropriate, when it is okay, or when the right time to speak is. Because when is the right time to speak about injustice? When you see injustice happening. When is the right time to create division when not creating division causes systems of oppression to continue? When is it acceptable to burn with anger when the light of Christ within you would otherwise be extinguished? We do not say, this little light of mine, hide it under a bushel. Yeah, that's fine. That's not how that song goes. 
It says, this little light of mine, hide it under a bushel. No. Are you going to let Satan blow it out? No. You're going to let that light shine wherever you go. Have you ever had that experience where you spoke up about something and you knew it was the right time? Where you took on the powerful with the hope of change in the world because you didn't care about giving voice to the people who have been silenced for so long? Have you ever had that experience where you took a challenge and were part of that great cloud of witnesses and you endured in that race knowing you were going to lose, but you tried and you fought and you pushed for it anyways? Do you ever just do something because you have seen the consequences of doing nothing and have gotten tired of it? Do you, as God's child, feel that yearning to scream and shout and praise the Lord in those places that are wild and dangerous and free? When you have, there's a good chance that you are responding to the work of the Spirit and God's work as part of the great cloud of witnesses. And when you do that, remember that not all clouds are beautiful, fluffy, wispy, forgettable things. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they are sweet and lovely and comforting, like blankets you just want to snuggle up into. And sometimes those clouds are loud and thunderous, creating light and roars amid quiet summer evenings. So when is the right time to speak up about injustice? Wherever you encounter injustice. And where is it, when is it appropriate to create division? Whenever you need to stand with God and against sin. That's important. You need to stand with God and against sin. And when is it acceptable to burn with anger? Whenever someone is attempting to snuff the light of God from the world. Let the light burn. Let it shine. Because there are very real times when we are called to break the systems of the world. To flip the tables of injustice. To destroy the powers and principalities in order to rebuild God's beloved community. Sometimes you've got to purge in order to bring it back together. you just got to get rid of it. Jesus didn't come into the world to bring about peace that pacifies. Jesus came to bring the peace that passes understanding. In the scriptures today, Jesus doesn't even say he's going to bring peace. But the peace that is called of us is that peace where all people have a place at the table. Jesus said he came to create division, to cast fire on the earth, to stir up trouble for the people whose hearts needed to have trouble stirred up in them. The great cloud of witnesses includes the beautiful, wonderful saints that have helped you get where you are, and it includes the powerful prophets, the martyrs, the ones who trudge through mud and gunk and all manner of other difficult things in order to make the world more like God's world. They include the best A-team you can imagine. Rahab the prostitute, a woman who could see things other people couldn't see and saved a community. They include David, the murderous king, who helped create a kingdom that and write more psalms than we can imagine, yet lusted after Bathsheba and killed her husband. They include Nathan, the prophet, who called David out and gave words of wisdom that forever changed the community. They include Elijah, a crazy person, who was also a prophet of God, who when children made fun of him, summoned a bear to maul the children, and then went to go and save a widow and help out a bunch of other people. <laughs> people are people, and they're complicated, and they're messy, and they're weird, and they're biblical, and they are who they are. They also include John, the fire and brimstone wilderness preacher who survived by eating bugs and wearing sheep's clothes, or camel's clothing. And Mary, that salty teenager, the one who sang about the tables 
of the world being overturned, about the place of the poor being celebrated, about the wonder that would become, all the while while being an unwed teenage mother who would bring God into the world in ways nobody had expected, seen, or encountered before. These are the genealogies of all manner of the cloud of witnesses. And now, that family tree includes you. So you are part of the cloud. You are called to be part of the cloud. It doesn't mean you need to be loud, obnoxious, mean, or rude. The opposite of nice and polite is not rude and mean. Don't take that away. And if you do, I'm going to come and talk to you and be like, Sister, not what I said. Brother, reel it in. Nice and polite are important, but not as important as kindness and justice. At Montreat, we had a tough day where we talked about resistance, and the takeaway from that day was this teaching. Jesus flipped tables, never people. Jesus flipped systems, never people. Jesus flipped hearts, but never people. Our call is to be the people who flip the world and build the kingdom, but not destroy the people in the process. Because as strongly as we fight for justice, we must also fight with compassion and see our sisters and brothers as our sisters and brothers, regardless of who they are, what they have stood for in the past, and where they're being called. It's difficult work. And it's part of being the great cloud of witnesses we are called to be. For you and I are called to be the hands and feet of Christ, and there is much work to be done in this world. You've named it, we've proclaimed it, so now let's go out and let's get it done. Amen?
heard the word of God read and proclaimed, let us together state what we believe using those familiar words from the book of Hebrews. By faith they crossed the Red Sea as if they were on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried it, they were drowned. By faith Jericho's walls fell after the people marched around them for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, wasn't killed with a disobedient because she welcomed the spies in peace. What more can I say? Through faith, they conquered kingdoms, brought about justice, realized promises, shut the mouths of lions, put out raging fires, escaped from the edge of the sword, found strength in weakness, were mighty in war and routed foreign armies. But others experienced public shame by being taunted and whipped. They were even put in chains and in prison. They were stoned to death. They were cut in two and they died by being murdered with swords. They went around wearing the skins of sheep and goats, needy, oppressed, and mistreated. The world didn't deserve them. All these people didn't receive what was promised, though they were given approval for their faith. God provided something better for us, so they wouldn't be made perfect without us. So then, with endurance, let's also run the race that is laid out in front of us. Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, Let's throw off any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that trips us up, and fix our eyes on Jesus, face pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him and sat down at the right side of God's throne. You may be seated. Let us lift up our hearts once again to God in prayer. Thank you, God, for the gift of this day and the gift of this community, this particular view of the communion of saints. We are so thankful for those who spoke your name to us and brought us in the church doors. For even Adam and Tamar, Judah, Rahab, Ruth, Boaz, Bathsheba, David, and Mary. For Gomer, Isaiah, John, Phoebe, Amos, Martin, Dorothy, Deborah, Paul, Nathan, Shifra, and Pua. We give thanks too for Marty and Vernie. For Joe and others who have called us together. Who have taught us your truth. Who have shown us the way of your justice. And we pray for our community, for those who are suffering, who may feel as though they must hide in caves, who are needy, oppressed, and mistreated. We pray that we would notice them, and not just notice them, but look upon them with eyes filled with compassion with hands open in kindness, with hearts open in generosity. As we care for our community here at St. Giles and also our community into Greenville and around the world, we pray that you would be at the heart of all we do as we act with justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you with one another each and every day. We pray this week for students and teachers, for those filled with fear and those filled with excitement, that they would know you are with them each step of the way. We ask your blessing too on those who are coming to the end of their life, that you would guide them into your arms peacefully, lovingly. Bind all of these prayers together, spoken 
and unspoken. Prayers that we know so well and prayers that are not yet formed on our lips. May the Holy Spirit intercede with us with sighs that go beyond our words. Then hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we give thanks for those who have practiced stewardship this week by setting up rental contracts and carrying old furniture outside and doing some weeding and trimming and mowing and all the things that need to be done, delivering food supplies and school supplies that we've collected. And... As we come to worship God this day, we are mindful of the gifts we continue to bring. The giving we give to God is not just a a once-in-a-lifetime check the box and we're done, but it's an everyday adventure with God. This week's needs are different from last week's needs. This week's world is different from last week's world. This week at St. Giles, I am aware of our need for a few extra committee members. So if you want to get plugged in with certain types of activities at St. Giles, you can talk to us, and we're glad to point you in the right direction. We also need some committee leadership. We also are just a couple weeks away from the return of our regular Sunday school routine. And right now we need one more elementary Sunday school teacher and two more preschool Sunday school teachers. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's somebody you know. But think about how you'll be giving back to God this day and this week, not just what you did so well last week. So as the plate comes down this week, as you have the opportunity online to consider your stewardship practices, I'd invite you to touch the plate to be very mindful of how you can be giving to God this week. As God has generously and abundantly given to us, let us return a portion of this to God.
Thank you, God, for your great cloud of witnesses. A genealogy of brilliance, a genealogy of struggle, a genealogy of people who are constantly working to build your world on this world's plane. Continue to inspire, to guide, to bless and lead, that we may be your hands and feet this day and evermore. Amen. What does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with us. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. We are part of the great cloud of witnesses, and we are part of the body of Christ. And that body is made up of many members. They're not all loud mouths. They're not all stinky armpits. They're not all feet that can run the race, or hands that can do the doing, or minds that can think the thinking, and be all brilliant all the time. Some of those are the hairs that keep the body warm. Some of us are the eyes that see where others cannot. We are all part of the body of Christ and all part of the great cloud of witnesses. So be who God created you to be, be who God calls you to be, be the one who sees and speaks and does. And go into this world blessed by God, whose love surrounds you, whose peace upholds you, and whose spirit never leaves you, this day and evermore. Run the race with God. Amen. Amen.